everyone. Um, I'm Corey Kripe Cookle, and as Dana said, I'm the founder of evaluate.com, which is an online appraisal service, and one of the things we appraise is silver. Um, I'm coming to you this morning from Western Australia, where I live, so it's bright and early, seven o'clock in the morning, so good morning, good evening to everyone. So let's get started. So we are going to talk about antique British silver hallmark, hallmarks today. So the real basic five kind of character uh, sequence of silver hallmarks. And they're some of the easiest to read and they're a great entry point for people who are interested in silver. So let's get started. Um, I can get my slide to turn, there we go. So the areas we're gonna talk about today is why is silver hallmarked, the types of British silver hallmarks, what do the marks mean, where do I look for marks and a few ways to get easily tripped up. So there are a few marks that may be um, a little easy to deceive. So we'll go over those as well. So why hallmark to begin with? So you have a piece of silver, why ruin the piece of silver by putting these little marks on them? So UK silver hallmarks date back as far as the medieval period, and they are applied as a guarantee of the purity of the precious metal. So the UK gave really one of the first and oldest consumer protections with these hallmarks, which provided consumer confidence. So the hallmarks are really a way of saying they're kind of like um, a Gucci label or a Prada label. They are the way of saying your silver is silver and here's who it's by and here's who guarantees it. So you have about a five or so marks that are really important when looking at antique British silver. And they're the standard mark, the city mark, the maker mark, the date mark, and the duty. So as you can see on the screen, there's a series of five marks and each of those marks corresponds to one of the bullet pointed words on the side and so we'll figure out what corresponds to what as we go on today so how do we decipher the marks if you look at them you're wondering you know what do each of them mean it's really decoding we're really going to just decode marks today so and these are the two series of five marks that we're going to look at the sequence in which you read your marks is really important. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about what order you read them in, because once you decipher one mark, then that will help narrow down what another mark is. So let's start with the first mark, which is the standard mark. So the standard indicates that the item is silver, and what the purity of that silver is. So if you look at the highlighted circle, in that series of five marks, that is your standard mark. And it tells you that it, yes, indeed is silver, and what the purity of the silver is. So the vast majority of the time, when you look at British silver hallmarks, you're going to see this lion, this lion, this cute lion on, four paws with one arm, one arm raised and its curly tail. And we call that the lion facade. And that indicates that it's 925 sterling silver. And that's on the vast majority of items out of the um, UK. The next one is Britannia B. And that was used for a short period of time during 1697 to 1720. C is the lion rampant, which you will see in Glaswegian silver, and it also indicates 925. Next to it is the thistle, which is Edinburgh, and it's 925. And then next to that, Dublin used the heart. But again, you'll see mainly the lion. So you wanna look for this mark first, guys, because if you don't have this mark, you're not dealing with silver. You're not dealing with sterling silver. You may be dealing with silver plate, but the rest of the marks in this sequence that we're about to learn won't make sense if you don't have this standard mark first. So looking at this sequence of five marks, does everyone see the standard mark? And yes, the standard mark is that lion. So we know we're dealing with a piece of silver and we can continue on with our next set of marks. So we see that it's 925 as well. 
Okay, so the so we've established the lion. We know it's silver. We want to know what city it came from. So the second mark in our sequence that we're going to look for is the city mark. And it indicates the location of the assay office where the silver was verified. So this is the office where they test it and say, yes, this is silver. And that's this, we're looking for the city mark. So out of our sequence of five, we have various options of the city marks. London's a leper's head, Birmingham's an anchor, Chester is an upright sword between wheat sheaves. So we'll, if you wanna have a quick look at that, we'll go over each picture and that may help you a little bit. So let's first look at London. London is a leopard's head. <clears throat> and again, London is a big city. So we're gonna see London on quite a few pieces of silver. So if you are out thrifting, if you're out looking at silver, a good portion of the time, you're gonna see the lion, Passant, and then you're going to see a leopard's head. And you can see on the bottom, there's the joker leopard's head, as I call him, but he's actually called the crowned leopard's head. And so you can see a leopard with the crown or without the crown, and that indicates London. The next city, which you'll see quite a bit of, browsing through silver, is Birmingham, and Birmingham is an anchor. And the frame that these marks are in, or a cartouche, or medallion, whatever you wanna call it, you'll notice that that changes shape. And as we go along different through different time periods and different incarnations of these punch stamps, the exterior will change shape. But the interior, anchor, stays the same. So. Chester is an upright sword, and if you look very closely at this image, in between the top two wheat sheaves, or gathered bits of wheat, is a sword, vertical. So Chester, the city of Chester, has these three wheat sheaves in a shield and a sword. And Newcastle has three castles, sometimes easily confused with Chester's wheat sheaves. So you really want to pay attention to that sword there have been many times that I've been looking at a piece of silver and thought that it was the three castles, but it was actually the wheat sheaves and I was able to tell that from the sword in the middle, just a faint little line. <clears throat> so then we have Sheffield, which is a crown, and you can see that you, and we will see that the crown can take different different forms. It's not always this cute little lobed crown, um, but a crown nevertheless. And Edinburgh is three a three-towered castle, as you can see in the image. And Glasgow is a tree with a bird, a bell, and a fish with a ring in its mouth. <clears throat> now, it's hard to decipher. I would always call this the Dr. Seuss tree because when you look at it, I don't know, I just thought of a tree in a Dr. Seuss book, uh, but it has to do with, it's a, it's a tale that is tied to the city of Glasgow having to do with this tree and the bird and the bell, and I should know more about it since I lived in Glasgow, but just look for the Dr. Seuss tree for Glasgow marks. <clears throat> and then Dublin, we would have a figure of a seated Hibernia up until 1807 or a crowned heart until 1806. So these are most of the city marks, almost all of the city marks that we'd be looking for um, when we look in our sequence of five marks. So we're back at our two sets of marks that we've been looking at. And you can see next to the lion is an upside down crown. And that indicates that it's Sheffield. So for that piece of silver, thus far we know it is silver from the lion, and it was made in Sheffield. If you look at the other sequence, um, can you see what the city mark is there? And um, maybe I won't tell you and let you through this presentation try to decipher that set of marks yourself, but there's a city mark next to the lion. So we see the crown, we know it's Sheffield. Okay. So we've looked at lion, standard mark, crown, 
city mark, Sheffield. Now we want to look at our third mark, which is our date mark. So this indicates the year in which the item was made. So this is a bit tricky in that the date letters overlap. They really coincided with when the new head of stamping, Silver, came into office and those elections were held mid-year. So if we look at our series of five marks, we see the letter V. And we know that it's that our piece of silver is from Sheffield. So we want to look at for the date letter that coincides with the city that we're focused on. So we use one of our on online resources, in this case, 925-1000 is a great resource for looking up silver marks, um, as is Worth Point, which we'll get to a little bit later, but Sheffield date letters on silver, and we can see where it's circled in red, the V, and that indicates 1819. Now, last night, my husband was looking at these date marks for various cities, and he said, how can you tell the difference? That V looks like the same V from 1863. There are definitely times when the date letter is pretty effaced and or rubbed, and it's really hard to see these nuanced little bits on the letter that distinguish it from another date letter down the road. So this also brings us to our other marks. They all work together. If I thought this was a V from, let's say, 1863, and if you can see in our date letter chart, 1863, there's a V. Once I then looked up the maker and matched the maker's marks, which we'll get to in a minute, I would know that that maker didn't work during that time period. And so 1819 would be the only date that would make sense. So <clears throat> you would you would also look at the other marks such as the Sheffield crown and see when that style of crown was used. So the other marks help you pinpoint things when some of them are a little bit effaced or you can't tell or can't um, see exactly what they are. Just use them and they work together. So there's letters of all sorts and all frames that indicate date letters. As you can see again from our chart, we see various letters and these letters only coincide with Sheffield silver. Every city has their own set of date letters. So one set of date letters, the Sheffield, will not work for a piece of silver from London. And so we have letters of all sorts. Um, and again, they will coincide with their city date letter chart. So now maker's mark. The maker's mark is a bit tricky and we all call it a maker's mark, but it's really the person who brought the silver to the SA office to be verified as silver. It doesn't necessarily have to be the maker. The majority of the time it is the maker, but it's technically, technically a sponsor's mark. So whoever was sponsoring it to get verified at the SA office. So if we look at our two sets of five that we've been looking at um, throughout the presentation, we can see the one with the Sheffield crown. We've got the lion. We've got the crown, we've got the date letter, which we have narrowed down to 1819. Again, if we look at our chart, so we would say circa 1819 or 1819 to eight, um, 1820, since the dates are um, mid-year to mid-year, if that makes sense. If not, ask me in the questions and we can go over that a little bit. Okay. So then now we go to the maker's mark and the maker's mark is typically going to be initials. And so you, we can see there's a group of initials on our Sheffield silver and then the other um, set of marks, we see a P and an S. So, so we know again, 925 from Sheffield, 1819. <clears throat> and we know that that has to be our maker's mark. So what do we do to find out what this maker's mark, what this group of letters, who it, who it indicates? 
um, who it corresponds to. What do we do to find that out? So we start searching. And, and this is really when you're gonna fall back on your resources. Um, I know a lot of silver makers, I can look at certain pieces of silver and, and just know who the maker is after seeing it multiple times. But this one in particular was pretty obscure. Um, that we're looking at. So utilize your resources. 925-1000 is great. Um, Silvercollection.it is actually where I found this mark. And it doesn't didn't show me an image of the mark, but it gave me a description. And if you see in the quotation marks, ST over N and H. And that's what we have, ST over N and H, if you look at the mark and that corresponds to Smith Tate and Company and they are first half of the 19th century is when they were active and so if we think back to our date mark we know it's 1819 first half of the 19th century so this is lining up that we've got the right mark we've got the right identification um, so as far as resources, another one, guys, is Jackson's Silver and Gold Marks of England, um, Scotland and Ireland. That's a really good one. And the Worth Point Library and Maps. Worth Point has an amazing collection of books, and they're getting more by the day. Um, one of them on Chinese export silver is just the book to read if you're looking at that, um, if you're researching that. So, yeah definitely utilize the library and the worth point maps system as well so if we look at our other series of marks we see a p and an s and this is the one that i'm having having y'all do a little bit of deciphering on your own um, but it is paul store and this is a pretty um, important mark if you're looking at british silver if you come across paul store in your pursuits of collecting snatch it up because Paul store is very valuable but so that's what that P and S corresponds to so we have four of our five marks and the last mark is the duty mark and this mark you won't always see on silver um, it was not used for an extensive period of time um, so if you don't see a duty mark, don't panic. A lot of times you'll see, only see the four marks, but the duty mark indicates that the tax has been paid on the item. And so it was a system put in place um, by the monarchy, by the government, to ensure that the item being sold, the tax had been paid on it. And so the duty mark was established from 1784 until 1890. And there are five main images that you will see in the duty marks. And that's King George the first, which is image number one, which you rarely see because it was used for a very short period of time. Um, King George the third again, but this mark number two was used from 1786 to 1821. Um, and that pops up quite frequently. Mark three is King George the fourth. Mark IV is King William IV, and Mark V is Queen Victoria. And so these marks are often very little, very rubbed and weathered over time. And so it's difficult to see these, the detail that we see in this image when you are looking at marks. So a lot of times I would look for the profile. So maybe between um, one and two and I wasn't quite sure when, um, you know, the date of the item or, um, you know, because I couldn't see the date mark, and I looked between the duty marks and duty mark one and two and noticed that the duty mark was facing to the right instead of the left, and therefore I could tell um, what time period it was, whether it was the first mark or the second mark. Sometimes you can't see detail and something as simple as, you know, which direction is the profile can help you narrow down the identification of your piece. So again, it's the duty mark. So if we collectively look at all of our marks, all five of them, hopefully I haven't gone too quick. Hopefully I haven't bored you guys. We know what our piece of silver is now. We can identify it. 
and then we can find out the value of it, which is really what we're trying to do. So our piece of silver, if we look at all five marks, is a sterling silver because of our lion, Smith Tate and Company because of the initial marks, hot water urn, which was made in Sheffield, England, and we know this because of the crown, and it was made or stamped in 1819 because the date letter is 1819. So if you look, it's this beautiful urn that we pulled these marks off of that was sold at Heritage Auctions. And you can see there's a little darker band right by the handle closest to the picture plane. And that's actually where the marks appear. So <clears throat> this brings us to our next question is where do I look for marks? And the first thing is get a loop, guys. Does it matter? Get a get a magnifying glass. It doesn't have to be a fancy loop with a light on the end, but something to magnify because guys, these marks are not always easy to read. Look everywhere for the marks. You can see in one of the images, there's a silver bracelet and the marks are pretty clear there. And on the urn, the marks were pretty clear, but you'll also notice on the urn, most likely the lid of the urn is marked as well and it may only contain two hallmarks sometimes um, attachments and pieces were marked as well pieces that came off of the larger piece of silver and they were marked but with fewer marks so you really want to thoroughly go over an object and then the last one with the paper clip i was showing this to my husband last night this is a little charm that i have and it's a, of a golfer and you can see the paper clip granted it's a jumbo paper clip but you can see just how tiny this item is i mean maybe in it half an inch and down the leg the straight leg of the golfer there's a series of marks this is as close as i could get but even with my loop i could tell that the middle mark is the lion because it was longer and more rectangular and i think the mark below that is a date mark but i showed my husband last night and he said i don't even understand how you're uh <laughs> seeing anything here but the longer you look at the marks the more familiar you will get and even if the marks don't look perfect you can still kind of decipher what they are so a few ways to easily get tripped up okay guys so Silver plate marks are very similar to sterling silver marks in a lot of instances. They're not similar in value. Silver plate, for the most part, has very little value. The marks can look similar. If we look under the silver plate column, you see letters that are framed within these little cartouches and medallions, um, it, which can look very similar to date letters. That star can you know, maybe trip you up for a city mark, but the sterling silver hallmarks are always going to have the marks we talked about. If you look down at the second set of five under sterling hallmarks, the MC and Co, and then you'll see Queen Victoria's duty mark, and you'll see the Edinburgh, Edinburgh um, Tower, and then you'll see next to that a duty mark that we didn't see earlier when we were looking at the at the lion throughout this presentation but the thistle is the duty mark for edinburgh my husband looked at that and he said this doesn't have a lion this is at sterling i love how i use him i hope he doesn't mind that i've used him as an example so many times but um he said i don't see a lion that's not sterling that must be silver plate and i said no remember the thistle is also a standard mark and then one other way to get tripped up is chinese export silver marks chinese export silver they were looking to british silver um, to to recreate and replicate and they also replicated a lot of the marks so this set of marks that i got from the worth point um, marks library maps library looks like silver uh british silver marks but it's not it's actually from uh china canton region of china lin chong is the artist and it is chinese marks so 
And then also effaced and rubbed marks, which we've talked about, guys, they're going to be rubbed. They're not going to look as pretty. The marks I've shown you in this presentation are very clear. Your marks are not going to look like that. They may need a polishing. And again, use your marks collectively together to try to decipher each other and, and know what works with what. You can't have a London mark for a maker that was never active in London. So. Okay, guys, so that kind of wraps up the basics of silver hallmarks. Hopefully, y'all learned something. Um, hopefully, you'll have some questions. I'm ready for them. Yeah, that was great info. Um, if anybody has any questions, just type them in the box, or if you prefer to have your mic um, off, then I would, or I'll turn your mic on if you prefer to speak just let me know on in the chat area. Um, I have a quick question on that P, was it PS, the, the one mark? Mm -hmm. was, does it matter if it's upside down? No, so these marks, it's like the Sheffield mark as well. Um, if I can go, see, you, you see the Sheffield mark, the crown's upside down. So the marks are not always going to be lined up real pretty and legible. You're gonna have to flip and turn your piece of silver and it doesn't matter if the marks are upside down. If the marks are backwards, um, then that matters. But if okay. uh, the marks are upside down, no, not at all. Okay, that's interesting. And that, and that urn sold for over $8,000, by the way, nice. um, that, wow. we, that we looked at. Um, yeah, so. It's a beautiful piece. It is beautiful, yep. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, you could just leave it in the in the chat there. I'm not sure if Nick is able to hear us. He was having problems with his um, sound. And um, Nick, if you can still if you can hear us, you can type a question in or let us know. And then uh, Betsy or Jessica. Okay, here we go. Oh, he's got sound now. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Nick. Oh, he logged out and logged back in. Perfect. Perfect. Well, those of you that don't know, Corey's located in um, Australia. So it's it's tomorrow. She's in our future. I'm in the future. It's Thursday already, guys. And, <laughs> and the weather looks all right outside. So. <laughs> letting you know um yeah but so guys with these marks what you and i may have moved quickly through this i tried not to um but i tried to remember that you know i'm exp sometimes when you know a subject you 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 rush sure. through it so hopefully it was clear but really guys british hallmarks are the best place to start if you want to start collecting silver they're british Silver makers were incredibly prolific. There are there are lots of bits and bobs of British silver floating around. You can go to a um, you know consignment shop or Goodwill or whatever, and sometimes find spoons, pieces of cutlery, things like that with hallmarks. And once you know what to look for, particularly what's different from the silver plate marks, you're good to go. Um, because then you know what to buy. You know that you're buying a piece of silver, and then you can go home and figure out, you know, who made it, when it was made, etc. Right. Um, somebody just said, would early. Oops. Let me get the first question. Um, similarities between American marks and English marks. Um, they're quite different. Um, American silver marks, um, particularly coin silver marks. Um, they're not going to be marked with any ster sterling because they're not sterling. So a lot of times that will trip people up. Coin silver is a different um, uh, purity than sterling silver. So in a lot of American silver, you will see 925, you will see sterling. But American coin silver, um, as a particular type of silver, you won't necessarily see any marks indicating that it's silver. So don't discard it. Um, but America was pretty good about marking things silver plate when they are silver plate. But again, it's just researching researching the marks, really using your online resources, your books, and, and researching them. Um, but yeah, most of the time, 
American silver will be marked sterling or 925, um, which is different than British silver because they have the lion. And then Jessica asks, would early American silver have had British hallmarks? Uh, no. Uh, to my knowledge, I shouldn't say <laughs> no, no, because no. every day in this business, I see something and think, well, <laughs> that's not supposed to be that way. Or, um, <laughs> But no, um, Generally. you might be looking at something that is coin silver um, or looking at a piece of like um gorum uh american gorum silver they have there's a lion and an anchor and a g they used that series of marks that's an american silver maker and they used a series of marks that look a little british so like if you're looking at gorum silver you'll see within a frame a, a lion not always because gorum changed their marks but you'll see a lion and then an anchor and then a g and think, okay, well, that G's a date mark, that anchor's Birmingham, that lion is, um, it means that it's 925. No, it's not. It's, an, it's a piece of American silver. So it, it, can, it can trip you up sometimes, but if you, if you do your research, and also Gorm silver usually has sterling written on it, which British silver didn't. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are similarities in the marks, but no, a piece of American silver should not be marked with British hallmarks. But again, I'm happy, you know, evaluate. We look at this stuff every day. I'm a, one of the silver experts that looks at silver marks and gives appraisals. And, you know, if you can't piece something together or you're unsure, submit it through evaluate and we're happy to help decode it for you. Sure. Do you want to show us your website? Yeah, so our website, evaluate.com. Um, our categories, we have, you know, a dedicated silver and objects of virtu category. And um, like I said, I am one of the appraiser who, ex who evaluates silver and um, we have other exper experts all over the world. I worked for heritage auctions, which I think if people are going to sell their silver through an auction house, heritage is a great place. I'm a bit biased. I used to work there. Um, but the director there, who I learned under, is really great. Um, I've sold a lot of Mexican silver, um, British silver, American silver, Tiffany, Gorham, all of that, Reed and Barton. So, um, yeah, so we're happy to look at your silver for you. Perfect. Always, always give us the weight, though, guys. If you are submitting an appraisal, always give us the weight. Everyone forgets about the weight, but the oh. weight's hugely important with silver and, and providing evaluation. So always That's weigh it out. That's a good point. I know years ago I had someone, I'm a consignment seller, and I had someone bring me a big uh, silver platter, and it was very old, and it had very interesting marks on it, and it was very challenging to try to figure out, and I did the best that I could, and I didn't really know how to price it, so I just put it up on eBay auction starting $9.99, and it sold for almost eight thousand dollars to somebody in canada yeah yeah and yeah and they were like this is a piece that uh one of the marks was some somebody from their family that meant a lot to them so it mm -hmm. was pretty cool so it was probably worth triple that <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, you know, people will just get things and put it up for sale and say, oh, the market decides. And it typically does. But, yeah. um, you know, the market will decide what something's worth. But what you lose out there is is advertising it to the right people. So even That's if right. you have something and you're like, well, I don't know what the marks are, but, you know, the market will decide. So I'll just put it up for sale without deciphering everything. Right. You lose out on, on a market who is a Paul store collector or who is a certain kind of collector. Yeah, so you want to have as much information as possible. And that's why, you know, we provide appraisals a lot of times to people who are eBay sellers and um, say, you know, I don't have the time to do the research um, mm -hmm. on this piece. I'll send it to someone who's an expert. And, right. you know, they pay $10 for the appraisal if they buy a bundle or $17 if they buy a single. And that's the difference between hundreds or maybe even thousands of dollars in their bottom line selling price. So, Absolutely. Yeah. When you I know, did that, it was like 10 years ago. So, yeah. But I agree with you 100% because had I 
you know, had you been available back then, I would have been able to um, probably gained a lot more keywords that were important <laughs> and yeah. identified it properly. <laughs> and a lot of times silver will have, so in addition to these marks on a lot of pieces of silver, which we saw on the urn as well. So let me pull up that image of the urn there. And this can sometimes trip people up that there is, if we look and see this engraved mm -hmm. shield um, or monogram or device, um, a lot of families would put their monogram on silver. And sometimes people think oh, that, that these things, these engraved bits have to do with the maker. No, they're typically the family who owned it. Um, we see a lot of different family shields and crests engraved on silver. Sometimes they're considerably smaller than this and they do confuse people as far as marks. But if you send it to a silver expert, they a lot of times can decipher these shields and these family crests and give you even more information as to who owned it and the significance of it. Mm -hmm. um, Cause that a lot of times will add tremendous amounts to your value. Sure. That's huge. Great. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. So I will give everyone back. Um, well, I'll give you back your morning <laughs> and the rest of us our evening. So thank you so much, Corey. It's been a pleasure. Sure. And I'm always happy to answer just any questions. You can shoot me an email, info at e-valueit.com. So if you have any follow-up questions, okay, um, great. I'm happy to answer those as well. But thanks, Dana. And thanks everyone for joining.